American societies in the Southeast. What I'll talk about today uh, out here, of course, is it'll center in on some of the use of these weapons and displays behind us and how it and how each of these uh, implements affected uh, as part of this the park's mission, which is to commemorate the, the expedition and its impact on the natives. And both these weapons actually represent both societies, and we'll talk about how each of these items work their way into European societies. primary weapon of the, uh, the Spanish conquest, as well as the European societies, is the European battle sword. The long sword um, has gone through a series of evolutions throughout its long history, from a short um, bronze sword through the Greek and Roman times to uh, the, the implementation of steel, and even throughout the Middle Ages, most swords were thick, clunky pieces of steel that um, really um, had a lot of imperfections and inclusions in them and would most times often break in the middle of combat. But Spain was different. The main kingdom that was involved with this expedition it was very different because in its course of history, it had the fortune or misfortune of being invaded in the year 711 by a group of North Africans called the Moors. What the Moors did in their invasions, or what's called the Reconquista, which lasted 780 years, is they brought in a lot of science and technologies, particularly that with metallurgy and mathematics. With that, they would start to train cities, important cities within Spain, like Toledo, with the creation of um, bending, folding, and adding in other metals with steel to make steel flexible and bendable so that when it strikes its uh, um, target, it will <laughs> vibrate, it will bend, and it will, and it won't break. <laughs> Not like the things that will hit, I hit. Maybe you just chop that off. Yeah, well, that's what it's out here for, is for me to be used. I'm telling the you sword that. becomes the center portion of the European family because the sword becomes more durable. This becomes an heirloom device, something that fathers can hand down to first sons, second sons, and so on. And that they can carry forth this weapon and continue to heap honors and glories upon their families. It's not just becomes something that you hang on a wall and forget about. DeSoto and himself would carry along some of his ancestral weaponry here into La Florida, uh, made and forged in the city of Toledo. The sword would become one of the most instrumental weapons in combat with the Native Americans. Uh, the killing point or the way that the sword works is that all the force that you bring down on the weapon is concentrated along one single edge. That edge, sh sharpened to razor consistency, will cleave into human flesh and more than likely take an arm with it if it is unarmored or unprotected. The Native Americans would have very rudimentary armor, possibly buckskins or leather, but most of the time they would run or attack the, the, the Spanish practically naked. The sword would be the, the basic line of, the, of offense and defense for every soldier that came along into the Soto expedition. One of the other pinnacle weapons that would uh, define Spanish military combat tactics would be the polearm. Weapons such as this, the Calvert X, the polearm was rudimentary in European combat and warfare to break cavalry charges. Of course, the horse soldier in Europe this time would be the tanks of the Renaissance or medieval world. Um, these unstoppable forces of nature, uh, heavily armored beasts, heavily armored riders, could plow into un, uh, unprotected or uh, undefended infantry and wreak havoc. Starting in about the 12 to 1300s, they, infantry would start to equip themselves with spears or lances, and then also into the Renaissance, they would then develop this tool, the halberd axe, which is your three-in-one multi-tool of the Renaissance world. How this weapon works is, of course, you would have usually a block unit of two to three hundred men, and they would then watch the horses charge up. As the horses get closer, they drop, brace, and lean. The front two ranks of, would have a bristle of these weapons out. The horses would stop or run up upon the blades of the halberd axe. Then 
as the first line are dealing with the horses, the second and third ranks of the of the, the Spanish Tercio unit would reach up with the hooks of these and try to grab, gouge, and snag the knight off of his mount. Once you get the knight pulled off, then you can end his life. Alternative use for this weapon, of course, is one gentleman from Sweden, who is the military curator of their uh, medieval arms museum, say that if this was an ATM or even a pension plan, for medieval soldiers. This is why nobles or knights would carry money on them when battle. So if they are dehorsed, they're lying flat on their back like a uh, helpless turtle, can't really get up when you're wearing 120 pounds of steel on you, they would usually plea with the foot soldiers. The foot soldiers would then say ransom. Those knights would then come forth with their pockets or their pouches full of gold and ransom themselves off to the enemy for freedom or actually more than likely be taken into captivity where usually their nobles and lords would ransom them off back to their families for even more substantial amounts of money. One little side note, if you're ever stuck on a trivia night, this is still a, one of the oldest uh, weapons still used in a modern military unit in the world today. Can any of you guess what it is? The unit that uses this. They defend or protect or bodyguard a man with lots of robes and a very pointy hat. At the room, at Rome. And the Vatican, though. Yep. Swiss guards still are trained with the use of this weapon. And of course, one of the more devastating weapons that the, the Spanish will bring is the lance. Spanish horse-born soldiers are were the envy of the Renaissance world. And it's not because they were heavily armored. Spanish caballero or horse knights were lightly armored. They drew, they rode into battle on light horses, not heavy war horses like we think of like Clydesdales. They rode in on what were called Andalusian or Pasifino stallions. These were light, very quick horses. They would do lightning strikes where they run in, hit, then withdraw, hit and withdraw. And they could be in several places at once. The Spanish horse soldier would stand in the saddle on that full gallop upwards of 40, 30 to 40 plus miles per hour plow into their, their enemy and drive their lances in. Here in the DeSoto expedition, many of the horse soldiers would turn the tides of battle when facing large amounts of Native Americans. Places like Napatuka and Mabila, the horse soldier turned the tide of those battles. DeSoto was ambushed in Napatuka in North Florida by 300 Timaquan warriors. He only had about 20 horse soldiers with him, but within 30 to 40 minutes, the horse soldiers had killed over half of the, the, the natives by running through them with their lances. On the fields of Mabila, 2,500 Atahachi attacked DeSoto. He's only, again, got 20 to 30 men, but they're able to mow down and take out any natives that run outside of the village of Mabila. And he was able to hold off that entire force until his army arrives later in that day. For the Native American, of course, their options are going to be limited. They don't have the, the technology, the metallurgy technology of steel. They're now just at their point in history, just starting to develop the use, the pounding and making of copper. They haven't, if they are using metal edge weapons, it's usually going to be basically stone weapons with copper inlaid over them. Majority of their weapons are still going to be lithic or stone based weaponry. Even in Mexico, where the Aztec or Mexica people were one of the more technologically advanced people in the Americas, the majority of their weapons are going to be stone-based, usually chipped obsidian glass as their cutting edge. But here in North America, for you grabbing the, the saber, the case, your primary infantry weapon is going to be the war club, made out of different kinds of sticks, some elaborately carved, or some just taken as direct tree roots with a handle carved into it, the war club is your primary weapon. Mostly due to the fact that Native American combat is not formation based, meaning that they're not gonna march in units. They're gonna attack you one on one. They're gonna size up their opponents and say, you, I'm after you. And I'm going to knock you down and take your hair, your nose, or your ears as tribute or trophy in the war. I'm going to take those trophies back and then I will possess power over your soul and your spirit. Death is not always the end result in Native American combat. 
If death is a result, then usually it's in the form of a conquest attack or raid, meaning that that Native American group is taking over, completely taking over that village that they're attacking. If it's a raid, usually it's knockdown tactics. I am gaining superiority over my enemy, not trying to kill them. If death is the result, then it means that their family or their clan owes a blood debt upon my family. That means that they have the rights to come back and kill one of us. So it's only in times of warfare do the natives actually kill each other. The Calusa to the south of us would take the war club and actually add shark's teeth to most of their war clubs. Shark's teeth then adds a whole new level. Instead of just a hitting and braining device, it is now a slashing and ripping weapon. This is weapons such as this would allow the Calusa to conquer and hold in their possession most of the, uh, the land of South Florida, from Sarasota down to the Florida Keys and all the way to the, west, the, sorry, the east coast of Florida was underneath the domain of the Calusa chiefs. Another ancient weapon that the uh, natives would use would be called the atlatl. The atlatl is basically a spear throwing device. This uh, device has been developed and used by native or indigenous people all over the globe. From Africa to Asia and Europe to Australia to even the Americas, native hunters have been using this as a natural progression of arms from uh, basically a development of the spear. The reason that this weapon is developed is to basically take down large game or prey, something that you do not want to stand very close to and throw your spear at. You want to stand farther away from bison, from mammoths, from lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. But the way that this war weapon works is that it works on a simple lever and fulcrum system. If the back portion of this thing opens up, open up. It works as a fulcrum, and you gotta take my word for it, because they've now broken this to a point where I can't use There it goes. Where the lever and fulcrum, as you basically move the pivot point on this, it will sling this spear. So that now I can sling it and throw it farther and harder into a big animal that I don't want to have come back and go to me. Of course, why does this relate to warfare? Because in 1521, the Spanish explorer Juan Ponce de Leon comes to Florida. He's going to try to establish a colony somewhere south of us in and around Fort Myers and, and, uh, and uh, Cape Coral. There he encounters the Calusa. They say that he was hit with an arrow that was about four feet in length and went through the thick of his thigh. Of course, the arrow was poison tipped and it ended up killing him. But a three to four foot arrow is a lot longer than any of these. So what most uh, historians or archaeologists can conclude that he was more than likely hit with an atlatl dart. One of those large spears hit him, pierced his armor, and was able to poison him. As we move into the final three weapons of our talk, these are going to be the top weapons of both of these societies. Of course, the most common weapon that we a lot of people identify with Native Americans is the bow and arrow. Also used in Europe, but fading out of popularity there, the bow and arrow was one of those few weapons that it was able to conquer army after army in Europe. The English, uh, the Germans, and many others have used the bow and arrow for conquest. English archers were so good that they could drive a bodkin-tipped arrow right through the breastplate of French knights like they did at Agincourt. Here in Native America, this weapon was not just a weapon of warfare, but was also a way of life. Children starting at the age of eight would start to train with this weapon and go hunting with it every day. This was what got you your food, from fishing to hunting in the woods. Also, as you were old, you gained older, you gained more skill, more accuracy, you would play games with this weapon, like shooting it through hoops tied to trees, or shooting it at stones being rolled on the ground. In those games of skill, many native villages and families would wager on. It was a way of distributing their wealth. If you lost, you lost a bunch of stuff. If you won, you got a bunch of stuff. And chunky players, which was the game played, would be 
elevated to the status of quarterbacks and heroes amongst their family for their skill and accuracy. But what that does is it allows a Native American warrior to draw their weapon and fire 15 arrows in 30 seconds. Out of those 15 arrows, 14 of them will hit their target. Also, from hunting and fighting in those woods, they would have the distinct advantage of the Spanish. The Spanish are used to fighting in formation combat tactics, while the Native American that's been hunting in those woods from the time he was eight to nine years old knows to lie in wait in silence and be able to draw forth on that loud, sneaky Spaniard and hit him. Most times, while staying in complete cover, hidden. So much so that the Spanish would believe they're being attacked by ghosts or soulless beings that they can now nor see, but just had arrows flying at them from everywhere. One thing a Native American archer could do is that they could also lie in wait and then they could run and fire on the move becoming a moving target, something harder to hit. The Spanish and the Europeans would counter with the crossbow, but the crossbow is starting to fade from popularity in Europe as well. The Soto's expedition would be one of the last expeditions to carry the crossbow on, on conquest. The crossbow, bow and arrow on a stick, gave the user more power, more accuracy, and took all those years of skill and training and balled them up and threw them out the window. I could pretty much will train any one of you in about 30 seconds, or sorry, 30 minutes or so to be able to hit bullseyes on a target with a crossbow. That's what would make this weapon especially deadly because anybody could pick it up and anybody could master it, especially peasants when they like to shoot at nobles when they're riding in the countryside. The crossbow works back on basically cocking the bowstring into a revolving nut. When you pull the trigger handle, it releases the nut, which will release the bowstring. Depending on what the bow itself is made out of, depends on the force that goes behind the bolt. This one has a 90 pound pull, so you have 90 pounds of force that shoots behind this bolt. That's enough pressure and force to pierce through metal armor at short distances. <coughs> and as you saw me shoot the bow and arrow, you can now listen to this. A lot of force and power behind that strike. Now with the rate of fire on that, I get about five to seven bolts in about 30 seconds, depending on if I have to use some type of device to pull back on that bowstring. So usually about five. But the main issue with that is most crossbowmen are trained that if you're my enemy, I'm wearing a shield on my back and to pull this, I usually turn around and pull this up. That exposes a big meaty part of my backside to you. And if I have a trained archer that can shoot 15 arrows into it, I have a big pin cushion to hit. Yeah, then the final weapon of the conquest is the Matchlock Archivist. This is the apex weapon of Europe. The gun was first introduced into Europe by the Turks or by those Moors as a simple gun tube on a stick called a gong. The gong was a basic artillery device that you would shove the gun tube full of a black powder, explosive, made out of charcoal, sulfur, saltpeter, or potassium nitrate. And then you would shove on top of it all sorts of things. Anything that you find around the battlefield. Pieces of metal, stones, sticks, whatever. Then you would take a lit piece of match, just like uh, Mike has over there, and I would touch it in this hole in the top, and it would, boom, shoot off. Now, there was no exact science into this. I could shove any amount of powder I want in there. Also, the recoil would have to go right down into the stick. So the stick could shatter, the barrel could break, or I could lose a finger if everything goes wrong right here when I'm putting my hand next to the barrel. So, over Europe's evolution, 
of this weapon. The Spanish, the French, and the Germans, combination of the willing of the masses, would improve upon this weapon, everyone adding a little bit of their own. They would lengthen that tube, usually made by barrel makers, so it got the name barrel, would lengthen it, and then they would take that stick and lengthen it down the barrel so it becomes the stock. The stock, what its job is to do, is be able to nestle in your armpit and take that recoil force away. Then the Germans didn't particularly like losing their fingers, so they would develop the lock. The lock is basically a simple mechanical system that all it does is lower that serpentine right down into the pan, igniting the powder, no fingers anywhere. But you still put your face up here, so you would get powder burns. And black powder does make you thirsty. So as a soldier on the battlefield, it's very important for me to have water all the time. I'm going to be very, very thirsty by the end of the day. But in Europe, this weapon is great because my enemy obliges me very well. They like to group up like you folks are in about a thousand or so and march straight at me over an open field. As a skirmisher with this weapon, I'm out in front of my infantry and I'm shooting at you as many times as I can as you get closer to me. If you're beyond 40 yards, I can aim at this woman right here and I'm more than likely going to hit her or him or him over there. And as long as you're the French, I don't care. I'm doing my job. I'm killing you. But within 40 yards, I then start to aim and shoot when I hit. But usually within 40 yards, I'm reaching the end of my powder reserves. And then, as you close into me, I'm going to drop back and behind my infantry. And they're going to do the job that they need to do. But here in North America, as an arquebusier, I run into issues. Issue number one, no matter how well I ask the natives, they're not going to line up in a big group and march at me over an open field. They have no concept of formal warfare. Shh talk them gentlemen or not. Second, those natives, while they're hiding, can shoot an awful lot of arrows. How many in 30 seconds did I say? Come on, you were here. 15. All right. How many bullets do you think I can shoot in 30 seconds? Well, we'll find out. Not many. Not many. Not many. What we're going to do is I'm going to act as my formal gunner. He's going to give me my match, like most gunners at that time will have already. And we're going to load and fire. What I need for you to folks to do is I need someone to put an apple on her head and stand over there. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh -huh. I nominate you. I nominate you. Right. Right. <laughs> what I will ask you to do, though, is everyone needs to count. One hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, so on. Out loud so I know at least how I'm doing. When I say go, and then that will give us an idea of how long it takes a trained arquebusier to load and fire their gun. So on my mark, get set, go. One, One hippopotamus, hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, three hippopotamus, four hippopotamus, five hippopotamus, six hippopotamus, seven hippopotamus, eight hippopotamus, nine hippopotamus, ten hippopotamus, eleven hippopotamus, twelve hippopotamus, thirteen hippopotamus, fourteen hippopotamus, fifteen hippopotamus, sixteen hippopotamus, seventeen hippopotamus, eighteen. So we're looking at what? Eighteen. Eighteen. And what I'll do is I'll add about four to five seconds onto that due to the fact that if I was really shoving a musket ball down there, it would take me just about a second or two longer, and if I actually aimed. Um, so we're looking at 23, 24 seconds, mostly. So, I'm a pin cushion. Yeah. <laughs> You're gone. But DeSoto didn't bring those weapons along for this. He wasn't planning on killing a bunch of natives with this weapon. He brought this weapon along for one very popular word, shock it all, as we say today, for intimidation, for terror. Because this weapon is something that the natives have never seen. The sound, the fire, the smoke this produces, the only thing that they can relate to is thunder and, and, and lightning. Basically, it's these guys have this wooden stick that they can point at somebody and then they die. So this is awe, intimidation. So they can control their lives as well as the elements in the palm of his hand and the stick. This we convinced DeSoto 
or have to let DeSoto convince many Native Americans he's a god. But of course, DeSoto doesn't act like a god. Gods are, in the Native American pantheon, respectful, which DeSoto isn't most times. And DeSoto does one major thing that a god never does. He dies on March 20th, 1542. So, one thing I can tell you that this weapon did do is it does save the expedition. But not in the way you think. It's not going to kill, like I said, a bunch of natives. What happens, though, is at the end of this expedition, the men are exhausted, they're tired, they're hungry. They've been marching for 4,000 miles. Their shoes are, ra are tatters. Their clothes are falling off of them in rags. But the Arkhamasiers still have their guns. They no longer have black powder. They no longer have shot, but they'll break those, these guns down. The blacksmiths will break them down from the lock, stock, and barrel. And then they'll melt them down, make nails. But those nails, the carpenters and shipwrights will build boats to allow those survivors. 311 out of 1,000 men, women, and children will sail and escape the cursed land of La Florida one more time. Thank you very much for attending our program. Our movie plays shortly at the Visitor Center, and enjoy the rest of your great day here at the Soda National Memorial.